Sorry, just give me a moment while I set up. Okay, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, as you know, my name is Hao Yi. I'm uh, very honored to be here with you to share, with some, with, to share with you some of my experiences as a recovering stroke patient going through the system. Sorry, I promise not to do that again. <laughs> and I hope you don't mind if I hide behind the stage here because I'm scared if I move around, I might trip and fall down. So, okay, I'm going to stay put here. All right, so I'm a research associate with the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I write teaching cases for the faculty uh, that they use in conveying messages about how public policy is done in Singapore. Uh, recently, one of, the, uh, one of the new initiatives at the school is this uh, Future Ready Singapore group that we founded. So uh, as part of uh, my research work for this group, we do uh, research work into the area of future studies, which is how do you anticipate change and how do you cope with change and I want to share some of the insights from that uh, with you as well. Well, uh, if it's not obvious uh, by now, I'm the reason, part of the reason why I'm here is that I was a stroke patient having gone through the system myself. And uh, you can see uh, the picture up there. Uh, that's a brain scan uh, that was done on the same day that I had my stroke. So this was way back in 2011. And uh, it was a Sunday morning. I was cleaning my motorcycle when I suddenly collapsed uh, in the car park because uh, the malformed blood vessels in my brain had, had burst. Luckily, the security guard found me quite, ne quite shortly and I was rushed, rushed, rushed to CGH and thereafter transferred to Tan Tok Seng Hospital uh, where my surgery was conducted. So you can see in that image up there that the damage to... The image is flipped, so the damage is actually on my right side to the right hemisphere, the parietal, par parietal, I hope I'm pro pronouncing that properly, parietal lobe of my brain. And so that's affected the sensation as well as the mobility on my left side. So uh, after that, uh, having gone through the system and interacted with patients, I realized that a lot of uh, patients actually had faced financial challenges in getting the care that we require when they go through the system. So in 2012, I worked with the Tan Tok Seng CCF Community Charity Foundation to set up, uh, to set up the Rachel Fund, which stands for Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation Assistance to Cure, Heal and Enable Lives. And this, pro this fund provides financial assistance to stroke patients who have trouble accessing the level of care that they need. And obviously, uh, you can tell from the acronym, that I was a civil servant at that point in time, right? So we enjoy coming up with these sort of names. <laughs> and, and coincidentally, also, Rachel is the name of my then girlfriend and now wife. <laughs> so I told her that, okay, I set up this fund for you. I'm not going to buy you a diamond ring. She was, very, she was very upset by it, but of course, in the end, I bought her a ring because you cannot run away from that. So after, 20, uh, after I was discharged from the hospital, I transferred the remaining bond that I had with the Economic, Economic Development Board to the Ministry of Trade and Industry, where I joined the Futures Group, which is a team that does long-range uh, strategic planning for the, for the sphere of the economy. And thereafter, in 2014, I joined the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, where I'm still there, uh, where I'm still there now as a case study writer. So, uh, from... Uh, from a patient's uh, perspective, uh, I want to tell you some stories. So my expertise is obviously not in the area of medical care. And I don't want to provide any medical advice here at all, but really I want to tell you some stories that I've gathered uh, in my journey through the medical system. So the f I guess I'm very lucky in the sense that I inherited quite a happy-go-lucky uh, sort of attitude from my father. But the, the first uh, person who forced me to con confront my situation in a very frank manner was, was uh, my neuro rehab doctor that I had at Tan Tok Seng Community Hospital over in Ang Mo Kio. So uh, 
a, a few days after I was admitted there and he had done his evaluations, he held my hand and he said, I read bad news for you based on my experience with patients of your, your kind of uh, symptoms. You will likely not recover your dexterous movement in the left hand. So I looked at him at, for a while and I said, okay, law. And, <laughs> and so he, he looked at me and he said, is that all you have to say? Then I said, uh, well, what else do you expect me to say, right? Uh, so after that, of course, he sent the, a psychologist to come and evaluate me to see if, <laughs> to see if there was anything wrong with me. Huh? And the psychologist had a lot of trouble believing that I was sad but not very depressed about my situation. And she even had to go and talk to my parents to, <laughs> to find out for real that, okay, this person is not like hiding his true feelings. It's not actually depressed and he's not going to do something to himself uh, later on. So uh, when I talked to other patients, uh, it, I became very curious about how different people reacted differently to their disability. So I started talking to my occupational therapist over here at Tang Tau Seng Hospital. And uh, he said something that was an epiphany to me, which is that your disability is actually, you have to split it into two. One is your physical impairment, but the other side of the coin is your functional disability. Are you able to do certain things? Maybe you have a physical impairment, but you can do uh, what you want to do. Maybe it's slower, maybe you do it in a different way. Uh, I mean, recalling what we saw in the video just now, now, there are many different ways to accomplish the same task, right? So uh, actually in 1975, the UK Union of uh, the Physically Impaired said this, and I want to quote this uh, verbatim. In our view, it is society which disables physically impaired people. Disability is something imposed on top of our impairments by the way we are unnecessarily isolated and excluded from full participation in society. I don't fully agree with this. I think it's a bit harsh because disability is, after all, a complex interaction of your own physical impairment as well as uh, the context in which you operate. So in 1975, uh, researchers uh, in disability coined this phrase called a social model of disability, which means that, yes, you have a physical impairment, but whether or not you are disabled in the context of society depends on the environmental support, the culture in which you are embedded, and of course, how accepting your social environment is of your physical impairment. Okay, uh, now uh, I want to talk a bit about the social psychology of the individual, uh, the psychology of individuals that are most helpful in this recovery process. Uh, there's this story uh, that, call, that is called the Stock, Stockdale Paradox in psychology. Now, the Stockdale Paradox is named after Admiral James Stockdale, who was the highest ranking and longest serving prisoner of war captured during uh, the war that the US had with uh, Vietnam. Now, uh, in writing his book, From Good to Great, uh, the author Jim Collins uh, looked up uh, Admiral, Stock Admiral Stockdale and asked him, why is it that you survived while other people died, right? So he was very curious, what makes some people survive and some people give up halfway through uh, being a prisoner of war? So Admiral Stockdale told him, I never lost faith uh, in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I will prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining moment in, of my life. So this is very interesting. He framed his situation, which a lot of us would think is a terrible situation to be in as a prisoner of war in Vietnam, being tortured for information and so on. He reframed the information to be a positive one that defined him for the rest of his life. So Jim Collins was uh, curious, so he asked, what about those people, those people who didn't get out, who didn't make it, who gave out halfway? So Admiral James Stockdale had this to say, oh, that's easy. Those people are the optimists. They were the ones who said, we are going to be out by Christmas, and Christmas would come, and Christmas would go. We are going to be out by Easter, 
and Easter would come and Easter would go. Then Thanksgiving, then Christmas again. In the end, these people died of a broken heart. So what is the Stockdale Paradox? The Stockdale Paradox is about people who are able to both keep the faith that they will prevail in the end, that they will succeed, but at the same time are able to confront the realities of their own situation. So come to the brutal, come to grips with the brutal facts of the situation that you are facing. So, uh, sorry, where's the remote? Okay, here it is. So of course, uh, the recovery journey, as uh, Miss Anita Farm uh, so so clearly put it. It's not and is never an individual journey, right? It's always with a team of caregivers and with the support and care of uh, your loved ones and family members around you. So, and sometimes as patients, it's very easy for us to forget that we are so focused on our own difficulties, on our own pain, that we forget to ask the ones around us, hey, are you okay? Uh, do you need encouragement from me and so on? And uh, this is a very important point, and uh, I'll talk a bit more about narratives and so on. Ms. Anita Farm touched a bit about that just now, which is, as a caregiver, what is the narrative that you're telling yourself? Are you a superhero? Are you going in alone? Are you doing everything for your loved ones? Or are you a fellow traveler on the journey of rehabilitation and recovery, right? Do you help and do you ask for help along the way? So. Uh, what she was referring to just now, this process of negotiating with uh, your loved ones, uh, finding what's the best way to give care without giving too much care, without being patronizing. This process is something that social psychologists call, call uh, interpretive labor. And in fact, it is a very difficult process. You need to sit down and have difficult conversations and find out what is most important to you so that you can set goals that are achievable, that give you that quick win to sustain your morale and therefore prompt you to put more effort into your own rehabilitation process. Now, uh, this sort of interpretive labour, sitting down with your family members and talking with each other, is not something that I think uh, Asian families are particularly good at or have a lot of practice at. And I certainly didn't have a lot of practice at it. Uh, but I realized in retrospect that it's something that's very important, sitting down, having that frank conversation, and putting that effort into the interpretive labor to find out what the priorities are, what is most important to each other. Now, I'm going to share with you one tool that I really like from the area of future studies. Uh, this is something called causal layer analysis. It is a tool that we use very, very often in future studies to figure out uh, how we, we view realities. So if you think of the energy of an iceberg, what you can see is only about 10% above the water. But what causes that iceberg is the rest of that 90% below the water that you cannot see, right? And that, that arguably is more important than what you can see above the water. So causal, la causal layer analysis is a way for you to keep asking why questions to get at the reasons behind what you see in everyday life. So causal layer analysis has four layers. Uh, the first layer is what we call litany. So this is what you see, what you feel, what you can touch. Uh, these are the tangible objects. So uh, what causes the tangible objects? You ask that why question, then you get into, then you understand the systemic causes of what you feel and what you touch and what you can see, right? And the systemic causes are things like structures and processes and uh, bureaucratic organizations uh, in society that produces what you, what you can see. So you ask that why question again, below that systemic cause you get to that worldview. What are your assumptions? Uh, what, uh, why, why, do you, why have you created these systems that have caused this litany of things. And below the worldview, you get into the domain of myths. So these are the narratives, the stories, whether positive or negative, that you tell yourself that, and that entrench that worldview that you have. So don't worry, I'll work through an example with you. <laughs> it's very complicated. 
even for, as we have done it for a couple of years. So one, let me work through an example of causal layered analysis as applied to, say, a patient who is going through the health healthcare system. So uh, when we talk about the litany, uh, somebody who has uh, physical disabilities, what are things that you can feel and see and touch? Oh, he might have a certain physical impairment. He can't make a certain movement. And the medical establishment is fantastic at dealing with these sort of problems, right? So if you can't do that movement, let's practice that movement. Let's build up that muscle group. Let's uh, make sure that you can handle that. But as I said, talked about earlier uh, when I mentioned the social model of disability, the litany is, might not be the most important cause of your disability. There may be certain systemic causes in your lived environment that causes you to have that that causes you to have difficulty with that disability. So when you go back home, is there a step, for example, uh, that that gives you difficulty when you want to go back to the go back go back into your house when you go to the work when you go to work? Uh, why is it that you have difficulty? Is it because your employer, you know, employer's processes are not suited to dealing with people of this people of disability? And below that, let's ask the why question again. Why do people assume that uh, we don't need to make the workplace friendly for people of dis people with uh, disabilities? Is it because we assume that people of this with disabilities don't need to work, don't don't want to come back to work? And finally, we get to the layer of myth. Uh, if you think about who you talk to the most every day, is it your husband, your wife, your children? It's actually not. The person you talk to the most every day is yourself. So at the level of myths, we get to the kind of stories we tell ourselves like, oh, I'm a patient, I need people to do things for me. You know, that is a very negative story that entrenches off the, uh, your habits that make it harder for you to recover. So, uh, so for example, if you're a patient, you've been in the hospital for three, four, five months, what is the narrative that's beginning to develop in your mind? Is it one of an active participant? Are you participating in your care or are you lying in your bed every day and your client and customer where care is being delivered to you every day? So the, I feel the hospital and family members need to work very hard to change the sort of myths that we tell ourselves. And in a sense, uh, where I was awarded at the community hospital, they did a very good job of this because towards the end of my stay there, they had this program whereby uh, during the weekends they would check you out to go home with your family, you know, they give you exercises to do. So that changes the story that you tell yourself from one of, oh, I need to have a physiotherapist deliver care to me, to one of, I need to plan my own care and create my own regimen to get back to uh, where I want to be. And uh, this, and changing the myths, I find, Changing the myths, I find, is often the most critical part in any sort of change making that people want to do. But if you look through this list of the four layers, for any change that you want to do, you need to make sure that the four layers are in alignment. So uh, when you're facing difficulties, is it because of certain things that's causing you difficulty? Is it a process or a system that's causing you difficulty? Is it the assumptions that you're making? Or finally, uh, uh, is, uh, is it because of this kind of stories that you tell yourself that and further entrenches and worsens your disability. Uh, that's the extent of my talk. I'm happy to take any questions that uh, people would have, whether regarding thank you very much. Whether thank you. regarding this in particular or future studies, I'm happy to plug my program at the school. You can come for a course. Well, thank you, Howie, for sharing your personal journey with us as well. Do you have any questions for Howie? And from the conference room as well. Yes, we've got a question from the conference okay, I room. Think we have a question. From yeah, we got a conference. So we're gonna go live <laughs> to wow. the conference room. I know. All right. Okay, we've got a gentleman. Hi there. We can see you over here at the theatre. Uh, if you could please introduce yourself and question for Howie. 
Yes, hi, Dr. Mikasa. Hi, good morning. Hi, I'm Mr. here from the United States. And I have a question for you. We over there have a lot of uh, programs in terms of uh, post-stroke care at home and, and uh, a lot of physical therapy at home. Uh, do you have any comments about that? I'm sorry, could I don't really, uh, could you ask me the question in a different way because I don't, I don't really understand. Uh, sure, in, yeah. terms of post, in terms of uh, post-stroke care, mm -hmm. uh, home care, uh, okay. do you have any, uh, uh, any comments on home care and how it can help people at home uh, from, from that standpoint? In terms of getting back in the community, uh, I, I, I had a back surgery and, and I, I had home care for a long time to get back to work and that helped me get back to work uh, very quickly. Okay, uh, so in my own experience and uh, I, I'm very impressed at the facilities that uh, Tan Tong Sik Hospital has installed here. So just above uh, this, if you go further down and you go to the fifth floor, they have this centre called the Centre for Advanced Rehabilitation Therapeutics, where they buy these hundred thousand, $200,000 machines that help patients in that rehabilitation process. So they help you make the movement correctly while supporting your arm and so on. So these sort of equipment technologies are, of course, extremely important. But what I feel is that uh, more important than that is to have that psychological intervention where you change the sort of narrative that the patients tell themselves. So instead of, I can't do an exercise unless I'm here and using an expensive machine, how can I design my own exercise regimen at home in order to make progress during the rest of the week when I'm not here. So I'm, I'm here, let's say, an hour, two hours a week. What am I going to do for the rest of the hundreds of hours that I'm at home? So uh, it's very important to change that sort of mental narrative, narrative that patients have. And once you do that, in fact, you don't even need all these expensive machines. All you need is, say, a rubber band, and you can do a lot of the sort of stretching exercises that are important to train the movements uh, that gives you that, the functionality. Uh, does that answer your question somewhat, or have I missed out a no, point entirely? Yes, you did. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for asking the Thank question. you. Thank you. Do you have any other questions for Howie? Oh, we've got a gentleman. We've got a microphone just there. If you could make your way to the stand, the microphone stand. Oh, we've got... Oh, someone can pass the microphone. Yeah, we can pass the mic to you as well. Yes, my name is Paul. i just like to ask you, because the moment on you get stroke, that means on the onslaught of stroke, I see. you normally get to be very negative and sometimes depressed. But I noticed that uh, from what you have narrated just now, that... Uh, you have adopted a very positive attitude. And uh, could you please explain why is it and how do we do the same thing? Thank you. I think uh, when anybody suffers any sort of traumatic event, there will always be negative emotions, right? But the problem then becomes how do you deal with this sort of negative emotions and how do you move forward? So there are, in my experience, in, even in future studies as well, two types of people. One we call a future-oriented person and one we call a past-oriented person. So when I talk to patients in the lounge while waiting for my therapy, some of them, some of the more past-oriented ones, the difference is that they tend to dwell on what they have lost, whereas the people who are future-oriented, they look forward and say, they look forward and think about what do I still have and what can I gain? So if you are a past-oriented person and you keep thinking about, oh, I've lost this ability. I mean, the, my favorite activities when I still had the use of my left hand was playing my Xbox and riding my motorcycle, both of which I can't do now, right? So then you have to give a different narrative to yourself and think about what you, th you can stand to gain from this point onwards and what do you still have. 
So if you remember the image of the brain scan that I showed just now, it was a big area of damage that was on the right side of my brain. So frankly, I'm very lucky to be able to form, put two sentences together and still make sense. So uh, I hold on to that thought every day that I'm quite lucky to still be alive and to still have what I have. And uh, my, I work together with my therapist and they are extremely encouraging to talk about what you can, the progress that you can still make from this point onwards. So that keeps me going. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have you got a question from the gentleman down here? Yes, uh, my name is Chang, Chang Fuk Tin. Uh, I have the same problem that you have. Uh, the way you express yourself when you say, okay, look, when the doctor told <laughs> Now, uh, to me, I have the same uh, feeling after six months, not the beginning, when my doctor told me your hand had to be mm. amputated. Okay. Uh, at the beginning, I said, no, I'd rather die. Mm. You know, I cannot live without yeah. my right hand. But I suffer very much. And finally, after six months, I said, okay, la, let me take off my hand. <laughs> so I told my doctor, uh, by the way, my doctor is a very good doctor. Uh, I form a very deep uh, relationship with my doctor, Dr. Mark. And uh, no, after my arm was taken off, I adopted your attitude. Okay, la. <laughs> now I don't have my arm, but I still live. Yeah. Uh, I like to pass this, your attitude and my attitude together to people who have lost mm. something. Uh, my attitude is, okay, la. I lost my arm. Mm. I still got my two legs. <laughs> I better make use of my legs. So that's the attitude. That's the news that I would like yes. to pass on to people yeah. who are very depressed. Mm -hmm. Always say, okay, yeah. I have something else. If to be more future oriented as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank saying. you very much well, thank you for very your much. attitude. Thank you. Thank you for your sharing as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for your sharing. And I think that's really a very important uh, story that you tell yourself, right? At one point, you have to say, okay, la, right, and you carry on. But the difficult thing is determining when you have that conversation, right? So, uh, and that is the more difficult part of the process. When should your family members sit down with you and start planning for what to do in case you don't recover any more function in your arm? And that requires a lot of sensitivity and a lot of interpretive labor that people have to be careful about. Yeah. But certainly, that is a very, very uh, uplifting experience. Yeah. Okay, la. with that, <laughs> I think we'll end off this particular presentation. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Howie. Thank you. Thank you for your sharing. And I'm sure it's very insightful for all of us. And thank you, you know, audience members as well, you know, for your questions and your sharing. You know, I think that's the purpose of having, you know, we have this conference room, we have the two-way, you can toggle over. The idea behind it is for us to have a discussion and we'll have more of that today at part two.